So the topic for discussion today is going to be the amazing myofascia. We will see what is myofascia, what is the present understanding of myofascia and how we can work on the myofascia as physical therapist. But before that, just a little recap about this dry needling 360 course. This is a free online course. I think it is one of its kind where you can take this course completely free, get six certificates and one course completion certificate and get amazing insight about dry needling and manual therapy in general. This is the third episode of dry needling 360. If you have not already attended, you can go back after this and attend the Dry Needling 360 first two sessions. How it is going to play is you are going to go through the study material tailored for every session that is a free reading material. Then you can attend the sessions on YouTube as in this one. You can attend the quiz after the sessions will be given in the link in the WhatsApp groups. Now I have 26 WhatsApp groups, almost all of them full to the brim taking this course and I'm so thankful that so many people have come forward and joined the WhatsApp group. Many of them are very senior senior to me, respect to them as well. Once you take the quizzes, you will, you will be able to download the certificates on your own. And once you finish all the six sessions, attending the sessions, attempting the quizzes, downloading the six certificates, I will issue a course completion certificate to you. So that is how Dry Needling 360 free online course works. If you want to know what this course is about, a bird's eye view, I have put a video which is there in my channel as well as in my Insta account. You can just go through it a small video so that you know what to expect from this course. This is where we are on 18th May. We had found, we had understood what the heck is dry needling or we had understood a basic intro of dry needling. Yesterday we talked about indications, contraindications and dangers, when to needle, when not to needle. Today we are going to talk about the amazing myofascia. So let us begin. This may seem, today's session, like a little detour where I'm not talking too much about the needle, but I'm going to talk about the myofascia. But then, if you are a cricket fan or if you are a fan of any sports, needle is the tool. In case of cricket, needle probably is the bat or the ball. Now, where do you play with the bat or the ball? You play on the cricket pitch, you play on the playing ground. And your myofascia is the playing ground. And like any cricketer worth his salt or any sports person worth his salt will tell you the importance of the surface, the importance of the playing area. That is why you must know the surface and that is why many people, most of the sports person root for home team advantage, home ground advantage. Now this is our home ground, the human body. We must know the human body and you must know what happens in the human body and how to modulate them. With that introduction, I will go into myofascia, but for people who are into say body work or physiotherapy or that kind of therapy for some time, some of the statements that I'm going to give you can sound repetitive or can sound already like that you already know. So I have spiced it up a little with some analogies and some metaphors. Please bear with me if it feels a little silly. So, for me, myofascia is like Spider-Man. And why this analogy? Is because muscle and fascia, together they constitute myofascia. And the muscle is the moving part of it. It's like the Spider-Man himself. Whereas the fascia is the matrix, or fascia is the field, or fascia is the water, where it moves more like the web of the spider. Now, when we studied myofascia, when we studied the musculoskeletal 
system of the human body. We had given in traditionally in anatomy, we had given a lot of emphasis on the bone, joint, and muscle. Fascia, we did not historically give too much of importance. So when we opened anatomy book, we studied a little bit of fascia here and there. We studied the epimysium, perimysium, endomysium, epiperiendoneurium, the dural folds, the uh, say omentums and all this. But beyond that, we did not see the fascia in its functional value. On the other hand, any person who has known Spider-Man will know that without the web, Spider-Man is nothing. In fact, there was a movie Spider-Man 2 where the web was taken away from Spider-Man or he was not con confident enough to use the web and then he had to travel via elevator. So that's what happens if you take away the fascia from the muscle. Without the fascia, the muscle is nothing. Muscles and fascia are inseparable like Spider-Man and the web. If you do not have the web, then the Spider-Man is just a regular guy. Then, now when we talk about muscles, we may ask how many muscles do we have? And anatomy books will tell you that we have somewhere between 640 to 650, 660 muscles. The books, depending upon the amount of dissection they have made, vary from book to book, again from person to person. Some people will not be able to move their ears, so those muscles have become vestigial. But somewhere around 650 is the number. Of course, if you are incredible Hulk, the numbers may dif differ a little bit. But then, if you have to believe the proponents of continuous myofascia theory, someone like Tom Myers, he says that we have only one muscle throughout the body and about 650 pockets of fascia where these muscles are inserted. So now if someone asks me, because I'm, I'm one of the fans of Tom Myers, I say that we have only one muscle throughout the body. And although that is an abstract concept that helps you to understand how the human body is a continuous structure. And then, when I say continuous, I mean fascia is everywhere throughout the body. If you see the first picture here, you will get to know that the pink thing here in the back muscles are the muscles, while the white thing is fascia. So if you see closely, it is very difficult to identify where the muscle ends and the fascia begins. So you can say that fascia and muscles are more or less continuous structure and as you can see on the sides that fascia is present between the muscles. So if you look at the rotator cuff here, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres major and the minor as it goes, in between you see a lot of facial white white fibers. So fascia is between the muscles. Now come to the second picture. You get to see that fascia is also within the muscles, the facial fibers. Now some texts say that facial fibers constitute about 40% of your muscle mass. If you if you are a non-vegetarian, will you will recognize this that within the muscle fibers, harder the muscle, difficult, more difficult it is to chew, you get more and more and more strong fibers. So fascia is not only between the muscles, it is within the muscles and not only muscles, any other soft tissue, any other tissue in the body has fascia. So if you see the nerves here, you get to see the epineurium, the perineurium, the endoneurium, all of these are facial fibers. Same thing in the muscle, epimysium, perimysium, endomysium, when the muscle culminates into a tendon. So all these tendons here are, you can say, thickening of the fascia. The joint capsule is the thickening of the fascia. Your omentum is the thickening of the fascia. So everything, now fascia is the ever pervasive structure throughout the body. Now, some more facts about fascia. Fascia provides contour to the body. It's like a body suit. Or you can say it's like the pouch of the water pouch. 
the soft tissue otherwise is a malleable semi solid structure your muscles or other soft tissues fascia is something that gives it shape so fascia provides contour to the body and then the other function of the fascia is fascia transmits the forces so imagine how a crane on the right hand side picture now see the motor of the crane or the driving force of the crane which which pulls the weight is not on the rope the motor is down there near the engine but the forces are transmitted to the effector organ via the rope similar things happen with our tendons similar thing happens with the fascia my extensor carpi radialis longus may be here in my lateral epicondyle from my lateral epicondyle but the contractile force is coming to the wrist or the other muscles that are moving the fingers are being transmitted via the structures related to the fascia or facial structure those are the tendons so one of the functions of fascia is to transmit the forces fascia also allows muscle play now for many of us who are still student of physiotherapy the muscle play name or the term may not be as familiar as joint play so what is muscle play is muscle play is the slide of the water slide of the fibers of the fascia on the extracellular matrix or the liquid matrix so as the muscles contract the muscle fibers move on a semi solid or almost liquid medium and those medium is the liquid part of the fascia so one of the function of the fascia is to allow muscle play and a lot of this function the effectiveness of muscle play depends upon the liquidity of the fascia the amount of water that is there in the fascia and that is why if you are well hydrated your movements are good and that is why if you are dehydrated whether you are in a sports or whether you are doing your everyday activity dehydration means muscle injury i will talk further in this topic in a in a few more slides now also the function of the fascia is to escort the blood vessels and nerves if you see this picture the black fibers here is the basement membrane of fascia if i if i am allowed to say so or you can say the base fabric in that base fabric you have embroidery of the red blood vessels that is arteries then the artery here becomes arteriole arteriole becomes venule and the venule becomes vein so from artery to vein capillary everything is held together by fascia not only that the blue the yellow lines here represent nerves and the neural network is also intertwined with the fascial fibers that's how it is held together now the significance of this is imagine that you have the tightness here you have the tightness in the fabric what is going to happen there is compression in the small blood vessels there is compression in the arterioles there is compression in the venules there is compression in the nerves and that is why many of the patients can feel relieved with simple stretching why because you have actually released the compression on all these structures with basic stretching now fascia is not only an inert basement membrane or or a background uh, background curtain fascia is actually an intelligent organ again one more spider man analogy if you remember this this is not venom this is your fascia how the fascia has conscious and unconscious sensations which like the black spider man the suit used to talk to him the fascia talks to you and like spider man was able to hear some of these talks sometimes you are able to hear the fascia talking to you right now if you want to 
you can appreciate the mechanical sensation that is coming from your foot. Probably you have a footwear and probably you have the floor without a footwear, probably your foot is soft and all this, the amount of the cloth that you are wearing, the clothes that you are wearing, everything is coming from the facial receptors to your brain. But there is also unconscious reception. Let me give you an example of us utilizing this unconscious receptions utilizing this unconscious receptions in our clinical practice many times we wonder why a kinesio tape which does not have any mechanical strength to hold your posture can work so beautifully and correct your posture or improve your function immediately if you are allergic to kinesio tape then you can look into a soft cervical collar and you can see how uh, that collar which does not have enough strength can produce uh, a correct posture. That is because it is meddling with or modulating your unconscious uh, receptors. On the other hand, you have a small speck of say stone in your shoe. How abnormally walking becomes we start to limp and unless and until you take out that uh, small grain you don't you cannot walk normally comfortably same thing happens when you have pain trigger point tightness or other facial dysfunction the abnormal receptor stimulus will not allow normal movement or normal posture now here we come. Tension in the myofascia regulates posture. It's almost like we are a puppet and the strings of this puppet are our lines of our fascia. And once you have lines in the proper facial lines, tension in the proper facial lines, you are able to maintain good posture or you are able to maintain correct appropriate posture. Now suppose the tension in the in the string of the puppet, if I am a puppet and my tension in my back extensors are less, I am going to slouch. If my tension in the in the one side of my neck is less, my neck will go to other side. So if there is an imbalance, posture will become abnormal. Normal posture means all around optimum tension in all direction. Now what is movement? Movement is nothing but dynamic posture. So tension in the myofascia also regulates movement. If you have correct alteration or change in the change in the posture, then you will also have correct movement sequence. We all must have played with this kind of toy where the whole toy is held together by a tightened string and as you change the direction of the string by pushing certain buttons, the tension of the string, the zebra or whatever the toy it is starts to move and our movement also happens in the same way. Once I change the tension in my myofascia, movement happens. So tension in the myofascia regulates both posture as well as movement. Now to have correct movement and more importantly correct posture, the optimum tension of the myofascia is of maximum importance. Correct? And that balance between tension and compression in our body is called as tensegrity. If I may define tensegrity in that sense. Now if you see this model, this is a homemade model, I have made it from six pencils and one string of wool. If you see this, this is a three dimensional structure, it represents three uh, Cartesian, three axes, that is x, y, z, all of them are in perpendicular to each other. This model of course is not my own invention a lot of body workers many people who wanted to understand the body they have made this and i have just tried to ape that i have tried to replicate that 
So if you see this, what is special about this, if you are seeing this for the first time, is none of the sticks are touching to each other. But they are held together as a single structure by the threads of the wool. And it behaves as a single structure. So the tension in the myofascia is what is holding my body also in its posture. And if you think of it, all the synovial joints, the, the bones are not in contact. In my shoulder joint, the glenoid, the humerus, the acromion, the, they are not in contact to each other. All are held together by, by muscles, by ligaments, by capsules and they can be termed as various components of myofascia. Now, to maintain the posture, to maintain normal structure, what we need is optimum tension in all directions of the fascia. Now, if you see the standard textbooks, they will give you this left hand side uh, tent example. That in our body, the bones are like tent. By the way, in our previous picture, the pencils were representing the bones in three axis. The ropes or the string here was representing myofascia. So in our tent example, the pole of the tent is represented uh, or is representing the pencil. On the other hand, the ropes of the tent is representing the tension of the myofascia. Now to have the tent poles erect, you have to have equal tension in all directions. Otherwise, what will happen? The pole will be tilted on one side, will be tilted on one side. However, many of us may not have used a tent, but if you are in, if you come from my side of the country, whether you are from uh, Eastern India or now I am in Bangalore, you all are very much familiar with the right hand side picture, which is the most people met. And you can use the same analogy, same example where the Optimum tension in four corners are very important and they are attached to some poles and the poles here are the bones and optimum tension in the ropes are, are the tension in the myofascia and that holds the whole structure together. However, while we see this picture, this shows a beautiful bed and a mosquito net. In reality, it's very difficult to achieve this kind of balance you know, in all four directions. This kind of Thing you can only see in, in uh, advertisement where they are they're advertising for, for mosquito repellents or in movies, in marriage scene and all. You, you get this kind of beautiful arrangement of mosquito net. In reality, in our life and especially if you, if you have lived in student as a hostel in student life, this is what happens. You know, our, our mosquito net is tilted many times. So what happens? There is a length tension imbalance. If you have gone to a, if you are setting up mosquito net in a new room for the first time, then you must have experienced this. In certain cases, your rope is too long and you need to shorten it and you need to make knots to shorten it. In other cases, your rope falls short from the pole or, or the window or the handle of the bike or wherever you want to try tie it. So what do you do? You bring one more rope and we have interesting idea of where to find these ropes and then you tie a knot and then you fix it. In the human body, what are these ropes? These ropes are muscles or myofascial structures. So when a muscle is too long, that is stretched beyond its limit, it also forms knots and these knots are trigger points. And when the muscle falls inefficient, you bring one more muscle in to function for the, to mask the inefficiency of that muscle. And then again, that extra muscle, that second muscle who was resting and now it has to work, it has to work for another person also forms trigger point. But those are metaphorical examples. Let us understand that for for a normal posture, you need good length tension relationship. For normal posture, normal function. If you have a tension imbalance, you will have a poor form local, locally 
and also your patient will have a global problem because if you see that again the tensegrity model those six pencils uh, 3d structure if you cut the rope at one place or if you tighten the rope at one place the whole structure will change and the hypothesis goes like that that if i have a problem in my foot because the facial chains are connected there will be some problem in my head also because the foot and head is connected now here sometimes we may have to take things a little more logically realistically so there is a counter to this theory which also i would briefly touch upon is called as ripple effect it's like yes everything is connected the head and toe is connected the hands and legs are connected but if i drop a stone in one corner of the pool the ripples will go to the other corners of the pool agreed but the amplitude of the ripples in the corner across the pool will be much lesser and sometimes clinically irrelevant so do not always try to look at the problem of the foot when the patient has headache however we should always be well aware about the global and local relationship because as it is written there body tries to balance by creating compensatory changes flat foot can be an, can be a wonderful example another example is of course the proverbial upper cross syndrome of janda where you have good link tension relationship for optimum function uh, so or in other terms you can say optimum functioning needs good tensegrity because efficient movement requires an efficient starting position you can do this right now with me you can protract your shoulder medially rotate your shoulder and try to flex your shoulder as much as possible it will not go similarly if you sit in a crouched position and try try to take a deep breath and then come back to good position and you can take one more deep breath much deeper because your movements are restricted your muscle imbalance happens when the starting position is not normal and because a muscle has a zone of uh, optimum function this is again your first sem or first year biomechanics you shorten the muscle below that or lengthen the muscle more than that the muscle is not going to function in its optimum position if you see this lady when she is in a correct good erect position her posture is fine if you see how she has crouched her sternomastoid is prominent here mouth has opened because of the muscle tension there is also a change in the scapula change in the thoracic spine and all this so so you can see because of the protruded neck there is local changes and global changes that brings us to what are the factors that control the facial tone and tension now before we go here we have established that our musculoskeletal problems problems of poor posture and problems of poor movement and dysfunctions inability to perform function arising from that is related to the length tension relationship of the muscles if the muscles are having good length tension relationship the posture will be good and the dynamic posture that that is the movement will be good so then what are the factors that changes or controls or contributes to the tone or tension of the muscle fascia one thing is external forces if i am standing now if you put say a 20 kg load on my head i will definitely change my posture and the tension of my myofascia is going to change but then what are the other factors the other factors are mechanical properties of myofascia and third is the nervous system how strong it is contracting both cns as well as ans mechanical properties means its flexibility its stretchability all the all the uh, viscoelastic properties but it also means the amount of muscle protein does the myofascia have the amount of tensile strength that the myofascia have that is the mechanical property 
the neural property is how much firing the muscle or the myofascia is getting at the moment how much efferent stimulation and how much afferent stimulation is there in the myofascia all these three factors will decide the optimum tone and tension of the myofascia so as a physiotherapist from a therapeutic perspective you can manipulate with or you can try to optimize the length and tension of the myofascia from two sides of the spectrum one side the mechanical properties of myofascia as you can lengthen so the middle yellow point here or the nervous property where you can either tune up the stimulation in the nerve stimulation or the or the afferent stimulation to the myofascia where you can actually improve the firing of the muscle or myofascia as a whole or you can tune down and reduce the firing of the muscle so that is called as myofascial modulation and dry needling is one of the tools to perform that but before going into myofascial modulation we must understand now so that if you are thinking about mechanical end as of now what are the mechanical properties of myofascia so if you see the mechanical structure of the myofascia in detail you will have to see it as a microscopic element as well as as a macroscopic element if you see it under the microscope the myofascia will appear as a bowl of soupy noodle where you have the soup the liquid part which is which is the ground substance on the other hand you also have the solid parts that is the muscle fibers or the noodle types of noodle and you have three types of noodles here one ramen sorry uh, one collagen one elastin and one reticulin on the other hand you have the liquid here the liquid is soup and soup is not only water in the water you also have some some solutes and they are glycosaminoglycans so you must have heard of uh, chondroitin sulfate the sulfated glycosaminoglycans or there is also non sulfated glycosaminoglycans so these are the structures if you see under the microscope i'll reiterate the bowl of soup if you put the myofascia under microscope it is not unlike the bowl of soup so your tendons here are more or less full of collagen they are having a lot of tensile strength they are like steel string of guitar pull you can hardly elongate them on the other hand elastin fibers are in other places where for example your your skin has a lot of elastin fibers you can stretch it a lot reticulin is elastin fibers are like rubber bands you know you can stretch reticulin is like uh, a lump of facial fibers which can elongate as much as possible it's like your permed hair you know and uh, sometimes again i i feel now yesterday some i had given a hair example and and somebody messaged me and said you have you don't have any hair how dare you give hair example so uh, out of that sadness what to do you have permed hair so you you stretch them they will be stretched you let them go they will also remain there is no very less stretchability but uh, i i would say there is very less resistance to stretch so that is what you get to see under the microscope then if you see the therapeutic viewpoint you may ask what is the importance of this information as a physiotherapist to me first of all we must understand that the fascia is full of water so you should have enough water i'll come to the water later then heating because the fascia is full of water if you heat up what tends to happen is the water expands and as it expands the the stretchability improves so if you aim to say 
say stretch the structures it's not a bad idea to heat up the tissue because based upon physics you know if you heat up something it, it expands then there is something called as thixotrophy what do you mean by thixotrophy if you have studied the properties of ultrasound gel or if you have studied viscoelasticity you will remember what is thixotrophy thixotrophy is a property of viscoelastic material where if you apply mechanical energy to a semi solid structure it converts from semi solid to liquid on the other hand if you apply if you take away mechanical energy to the semi solid structure it will become more solid how does it make sense as a physiotherapist number 1 if you want to prevent injury before a physical activity give mechanical energy that means warm up before function will prevent will increase the stretchability will prevent injury on the other hand if you have not imparted mechanical energy to a semi solid myofascia there is more chance of solidifying for example i don't have any problem in my hand but if you just for the sake of it put a plaster in my hand what is going to happen is i may have to uh, for after 6 weeks i may have to have physiotherapy because i will nonetheless have range of motion restriction because solid structure like the semi solid structure has converted to solid structure so if i am for 4 weeks in a wheelchair with say a pop in my leg i may have difficulty in walking even if even if my bone has healed now coming to supplementation you all must have seen people getting glucosamine supplements and chondroitin supplements so these are the supplements that is essential for your tendon health however understand this in case of osteoarthritis glucosamine does not work is what the aaos says so when you look for supplementation when you advise supplementation to your patient you must look up the literature again for tendon health these supplements work fantastically there is research proof behind that now coming to water you all have seen competitive swimmers if you see these swimmers you must have seen that they travel in lanes now this lanes the separator of these lanes are the non contractile facial fibers so your collagen your elastin your reticulin all of this they form the the lanes for the muscle fibers or the swimmers to swim and this is the optimum scenario there is a lot of water on the uh, on the lake and the muscle fibers move very smoothly you get good muscle play you get get good function you get good strong contraction however if there is more ground substance and less water what is going to happen your movement is going to be severely restricted and that is why the importance of water supplementation is 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 cannot be over emphasized basically so uh, that brings us to the question how much water should you drink now i have developed a way to communicate with the patient when the patient asks how much water do should i drink i give him a counter question of how much money do you earn or how much money should you earn the thing is both the questions are individualistic if you are say bill gates then the amount of money you should earn is much more higher than if you are myself and the answer is it will depend upon the requirement however understand this our kidneys filter about 180 liters of water a day a blood a day so at least you give back 2% of it to the body which is about say 3 uh, to 4 liters anything below that and you fall in the below poverty level category now sometimes you have enough water in the playing field in the pool but you also have extra facial fibers extra fibers and that will also severely restrict your movement and in such a scenario you have to look for 
manual therapy where you disentangle the facial fibers this can be a case of scar tissue this can be a case of say uh, tightness of fascia or something like that so many manual therapy including dry needling will be able to help your patient out if the patient's muscle fibers are not having normal alignment and normal play so from this to this is the role of you as a manual therapist now this was the microstructure of the myofascia let us look at the macrostructure if you see the macrostructure if you see the body as a whole it is proposed that the fascia of a muscle is continuous with its bony attachment on both ends via tendon and periosteum uh, so this brings us to the theory that the whole body is connected via facial chains tom myers call it as anatomy trains uh, and he has identified he shows in his video of anatomical dissection where all these structures are continuous so for example the first picture here you see the plantar fascia which is continuous with the calf muscle uh, via the periosteum of the of the uh, calcaneum and then from the tendocalcaneum to calf muscle calf muscle to hamstring hamstring to sacrotibial ligament to sacrospinalis muscle erector spinae to the occipital frontalis and he has found connections in multiple directions in in the musculoskeletal system of the whole body now Thomas, however, is not the only person, or is not the only theory, where he talks, or where we understand the whole body connection. We were always aware of kinetic chain. Take this example. EMG studies say when you perform right shoulder flexion, before the deltoid starts to show any activity. there is the activation of the alternate contralateral soleus activation of the right tfl right rectus femoris activation of the left hamstring activation of the gluteus maximus and finally erector spinae on the right side before the deltoid is activated that means the whole body works as a single structure like whole of the myocardium works as a sensitium the whole body muscles also work in conjunction which also means that if i have a shoulder problem the root of the problem may have been in the hamstring and when you have all these structures in integration functioning together you know what happens look at the next slide you'll get to see the famous 1 inch punch of bruce lee now how does bruce lee do it just a distance of 1 inch if you look at his leg you'll understand see how he is generating rotational force and see the amount of plantar flexion he is making and how the shoulder movement is happening the shoulder girdle is moving all together he is culminating this force into the fingers and he is generating so much of force that this person is not only falling on the chair but also the chair is sliding back and that is see the amount of extension that is happening in his forward leg and backward leg and see the amount of plantar flexion that he is getting in his backward leg so when everything works in conjunction everything is optimized you generate this much of force now you may ask okay he is bruce lee he needs that kind of force what about me or what about my patient my patient is a 55 years old housewife she doesn't want to go for one inch punch but then the bruce lee's one inch punch he must have must have practiced thousand times but he must have done it only a few times to demonstrate my patient of say 55 years old homemaker who is cooking by reaching to the shelf above now if my patient has say 
inefficient gluteus maximus and she is doing 10 times a day or 20 times a day every day then that repetitive trauma because the gluteus maximus is not working that shoulder muscles are into into increased demand so that repetitive trauma may produce some symptoms in our run of the mill patient even if i am not treating bruce lee and if you are a sports physiotherapist you may have to assess this completely and there are good assessment techniques available for kinetic chain dysfunctions so then as a physiotherapist again how does this information is going to be useful first when you have a patient you have to look at local and global scenario separately if i have a shoulder issue look at my shoulder but please do not forget to look at the rest of the kinetic chain it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes of assessment if you have something do address it also you will have to look at the length tension relationship in the first session we itself we have said about what Leon Chaito says, Chaito says trigger point and we can infer it to any dysfunction of the body it is coming from a root cause, maybe poor ergonomics, maybe muscle weakness, maybe, uh, maybe mechanical structures are not in alignment and find the root cause, treat it and that also tells us that manual therapy whether it is dry needling, whether it is cupping, whether it is uh, any other form of manual therapy it's not a standalone treatment. It's just a side dish where your main dish is functional activity, exercise, stabilization, functional stabilization, postural connection, correction, and and adherence to your uh, commitment of living a healthy life from your patient. So we had seen the mechanical connection of myofascia. Now we'll see the neural connection of myofascia. So, what are the receptors that are talking like that venom as, as it was talking to the spider in the suit? Now, our body suit has two types of receptors. One set of receptors can be called as mechanoreceptor. The other set of receptor I have listed here is the nociceptor, pain receptor. So, to remember them, you can you can remember them as G R I P P. G for Golgi tendon organ, R is for Ruffini, I is for interstitial receptors, P is for passenian corpuscle, as well as P is for pain receptor. So, the passenian corpuscle, let us take it first. It detects sudden changes in pressure, it detects kinesthesia basically, and all these mechanoreceptors travel via dorsal column. Clinically modulated by high velocity thrust as well as vibration. So, if you feel relaxed by vibration, now the, now the function of the passini is it kind of resets the receptor. If you, if you stimulate the passini with a single thrust, it resets the receptor. It's, if I have to give a metaphorical example, the way your uh, defibrillator resets the rhythm of the heart. The passenian corpuscle stimulation can reset the, the length tension relationship. But the problem with high velocity thrust is it needs a lot of skill, and unless you are skilled, you may produce this. Jokes apart. The next set of receptors I want to talk about is GTO, Golgi tendon organ. The Golgi tendon organ, as you know, is an inhibitory receptor and can be modulated very effectively with active contraction. Understand this Golgi tendon organ cannot be activated or cannot be uh, regulated by passive compression of the tendon. Its best or its most uh, significantly it is activated via uh, active contraction. So that is why we use either post isometric relaxation in this in this diagram or reciprocal inhibition in this diagram in other terms muscle energy technique or you want to call it as pnf pnf ruffini ruffini detects 
deep pressure, clinically modulated by deep pet research, and it reduces the sympathetic tone. So that is why after when you are stressed, if you get a deep pressure, then you are relaxed. Your your sympathetic tone comes to parasympathetic. Your breathing pattern changes. Your your stress tension then changes it reduces the muscle tone visibly by stimulation of the rufeni interstitial fibers are interesting because they sense deep pressure and they change blood flow from the circulation to the extracellular fluid so understand this also that when you are massaging if your if you are massaging or if you are giving myofascial release now in in present days sometimes the massage is a taboo word so let us use myofascial release when you are giving myofascial release to a, a client you are not planning to overtly stimulate the rufini if the patient has to go if your client has to go and perform if you are a sports physiotherapist and your your player is yet to perform then you are not going to say give deep pressure around the way it is showing or paraspinally paravertebrally that is going to put the person into too much of relaxation on the other hand you probably are looking at effleurage to improve the function of the muscle before performance now coming to the pain receptors you have the pain pathway the a delta fibers uh, We'll talk about this in detail tomorrow. How dry needling stimulates A delta, and then it takes away the C pain. But understand this: A delta fibers are everywhere in the body. Most importantly, A delta fibers on the extraceptors on the on the surface, and dry needling is probably one of the most efficient way to stimulate A delta and to to produce. Significant strong analogies here. More about it tomorrow. Day before, someone asks, why not Hindi? So this is a little bit from Madhushala, uh, Bachchan Sabs. Uh, so it goes, it goes like Madhuralai jaane ko ghar se chalta hai pine wala. Kis pat jaun asamanjas mein hai wo bola bala. Alag alag pat batlaate sab, par main ye batlaata hu. Raah pakar tu ek chala chal pa jayega Madhushala. What it means is. As a physiotherapist, if you are spoiled with choice or confused with the amount of choices, whether to go with the mechanical way and manually stretch or release the fibers, or whether to stimulate the receptors to work on the myofascia, or which kind of stimulation to choose, you are free to choose whatever that. you feel like effective because always there are multiple ways to reach to the same destination whatever you know and whatever you are comfortable with coming back to again our first uh, our our uh, superficial dry needling in our first session i said that someone who was as skillful as dr peter balre did not want to go further in the supra in the in the scalenius muscle because he was not comfortable so similarly always understand this if you are using needling because primarily we are talking in the context of needling when in doubt stay out you are not a needle therapist you are a physiotherapist and needling is one of your uh, one of your arms in the arsenal again so you may try multiple things and finally whether you are using the cup or your istm or the kinesio tape or you are simply stretching your patient or you are performing a high velocity thrust to your patient in every case all you are trying to do is you are trying to modulate the myofascia either via the mechanical end of the spectrum or the neural end of the spectrum but but for all practical scenarios probably both of them simultaneously now where does needling fit in 
dry needling also modulates the myofascia and dry needling does it in both mechanical as well as neural way the stimulation of the needle on the body stimulates the mechanoreceptors stimulates the neuroreceptors stimulate the pain receptors the mechanical movement of the dry needle is is and there are multiple ways of movement is can produce a unique kind of mechanical stimulation which is virtually impossible with any other forms of modality because in all other physiotherapeutic interventions you are doing it from the exterior but with needle you are reaching that structure you are reaching to the supraspinatus which is below your upper trapezius you are reaching the multifidus which is below your erector spinae and that is why needle becomes so useful but understand this whether you are needling or whether you are cupping whether you are taping whether you are doing any other form of manual therapy you are probably doing a myofascial modulation thank you okay so that is what i wanted to talk about today now let me see if there is any discussion happening what is superficial line between myofascial line uh, are you talking about superficial back line which i was discussing the superficial back line is a line of fascia which which is one of the anatomy trends uh, wishing for jisna mohammad wishing for cupping therapy class uh, okay maybe sometime once we finish with this when are you going to start cupping therapy i do it all the time to myself and to my patients uh, thank you thank you all all of you have given compliment so thank you for that anindo thank you thank you for all the all the appreciation so many known people all of dr meena thank you thank you dr meena uh, javed my old student thank you javed so if there is no more question i'll finish it here hi pallav how are you hi pooja dhage i met you in pune i remember faizan you have been very supportive all the time and i'm not taking any more names but all of you thank you so much thank you for being here thank you for being such a nice audience i'll finish it here we'll resume tomorrow and be there tomorrow tomorrow we are doing something very interesting tomorrow we are understanding how needling can produce analgesia so tomorrow 2 o'clock be there thank you